here on IG as well. Let's see, make sure we got some sound on Instagram. Next B, got uh, some sound happening on Instagram. Get the things, everything set. So if you're on Instagram and you're listening right now, should uh, let me know if it's not happening very well. Hello, Matt Musso, Hat Ika Fergie. Um, hope everyone's doing super well. It's Friday. It's March 5th, and uh, we are live. I think I put the date in wrong on uh, the title, but that's okay. What's up, Doug? How are you, man? Uh, Robert Cosma, Svetlana Jazz. Hello, hello. It's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's, an, it's a day. It's a Friday. Hello, DJ. Just saying hello as people come in. Hope everyone's having a nice Friday so far. Uh, Luke is here. Hello, Luke. Uh, this is our weekly Q&A session. If you're joining for the first time, every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we've been going live for 57 or 58 uh, episodes here. So uh, excited to continue that uh, today. And I thought today that maybe we would start with a little music, a little playing. I've been uh, working on a few things. Uh, most recently, uh, hello, Slide Attack Jazz, what's up? Uh, most recently, I've been... Uh, working on a new kind of course and book having to do with drones uh, and improvising with drones and uh, tuning and all this kind of stuff. So what I thought I would do is I might kick off our live stream today with a little music and then open it up for questions after that. There's always usually a lot of really great questions, so I'm excited to get uh, into the questions. But um, yeah, so I think the first thing we'll do uh, is just I wanted to talk about and set up and like how you can use drones to do two things to warm up with creativity. That's what I want to talk about, like warming up with creativity and um, not just uh, sticking with your normal routine every time. Because, yeah, I mean, it's cool. You can do your routine all the time, but sometimes you need to switch it up. Sometimes you need something new, something fresh, and we want to also exercise that creativity muscle at the same time. So what I like to do is set a timer or use like the length of a track. Maybe it's four minutes or five minutes or seven minutes. These are around seven minutes. These tracks, I'm not going to play the whole time for the whole the whole drone track but if i was doing it by myself i would probably say all right i'm going to improvise for this this is seven minutes and 18 seconds so i'm going to that's my constraint i'm going to just improvise in in a key so i have been putting together these different drones and so i've got this uh, a synthesizer drone here that i'm gonna get going and i'm just gonna play uh, i'm just gonna play a little bit and so it's kind of a warm-up and it's kind of a uh an exercise in creativity and so we're going to kind of do both it's kind of a meditation it's been a crazy week for me for sure busy crazy uh, and uh, I'm sure it's been busy and crazy for lots and lots of people out there but uh, sometimes you just need to play just play and like use that drone so uh, I'm gonna get the live stream started today with a little with a little playing with the drones and then uh, we'll jump in with questions so if you've got questions feel free to drop them into the chat drop them into a comment on YouTube or Facebook if you're on Instagram you can put it in the comments or use the the question function either way and we'll get to those in just a second but I just wanted to start this off with a little music because usually we just jump right into questions and I don't get to talk about uh, what I, I usually have something to talk about so I want to make sure that we talk about that I'm talking about exercising that creativity muscle that uh, improvisation muscle outside of tunes because we often get bogged down in trying to play uh, other people's harmony and sometimes we need to just practice hearing our own stuff so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, and do that. Uh, and we're, we're gonna do E flat. So the drone is an E flat, and we're gonna get this going here.
All right. We're back. Okay, I saw some comments coming in on Instagram. It was too hot. It was too loud. Sorry. Uh, sorry, it was too hot. Oh, and you couldn't hear the drone. Perfect. Well, oh well. One of these days I'll figure out uh, how to work my own technology. But hello to those that are just joining now on IG. Zachary, hello, hello. Um, I don't think I had the... Uh, I don't think I had that right. But anyway, that's cool. Um, just wanted to get going and uh, play a little music, but we'll get into the Q&A here now. I hope uh, everyone, if you're just joining, is having a nice Friday. And uh, I'll figure out my technology one of these days. But uh, oh, thank you, Kevin, for tuning in. Uh, nice. Uh, nice, yeah. Tony Glassy has some and songs to say about the landscape of the Columbia River Gorge. I, Gorge. I can't say I've ever been there. I have not spent enough time in the Pacific Northwest, really. Uh, so it's something I'd like to do at some point. But uh, it hasn't happened yet. So not yet. So anyway, I just think that, uh, you know, I wanted to share a little bit. Uh, oh, okay. So on YouTube, it was working. It's just my setup into IG that isn't working. Right. That's all right. Totally cool. Uh, I'll figure it out one of these days. And um, I just wanted to, you know, take that time to just talk about, you know, just trying to exercise that creativity muscle, as you like to say, you know, as I like to say, just because it's sometimes, like I said, we get caught up in like harmony and trying to play harmony and trying to get slick playing harmony, like substitutions and this and that and the other things. So uh, to me, it's just a matter of being able, of having a wide variety of improvisational uh, ideas, a wide range of improvisational uh, landscapes, I guess, to go along with uh, the comments that Kevin was making. Uh, but just you have to practice just creating because I think uh, somebody asked, uh, I, I collected some questions um, this week about some potential YouTube videos to make about different things. And. Uh, I did that on Instagram and somebody was asking about the connection between improvisation and composition. And for me, they're just like 100% intrinsically linked because your, your, your compositional and improvisational voice are almost one and the same other than that your compositional voice is just a little slower, right? And your improvisational voice is faster and happening in the moment. But the, the, your brain and your ears are probably hearing a lot of the similar kind of stuff. And so it's just like in time composition or out of time composition is how I kind of view it and how I think about it and how I think about developing a voice as a composer or as an arranger, as an improviser, all of those things. So uh, I think I'm going to try to try to get into something uh, a little deeper on a YouTube video about that at some point. But um, yeah, anyway, just trying to uh, exercise my own creativity muscle this morning and do a little improvising with a drone. So hopefully that might inspire you. And like I said before, like it's coming soon. A new book course uh, of uh, drone exercises and drone um, drone exercises and drone uh, it's a book kind of uh, creativity thoughts or things like that. Anyway. So I guess to see some questions coming in now. Thanks for those questions, folks. Appreciate it. Uh, the first one that came in was from Jonathan on Facebook. So Jonathan says, what keeps you motivated these days? Um, hmm. Well, not being satisfied, I guess, is the answer. That's the honest answer. Um, I guess I have, um, I don't know, lofty aspiration, aspirations, I suppose. And so those keep me focused on making small incremental uh, improvement. I'm trying to take better care of being happy with, you know, taking those small steps. A lot of times, sometimes I get frustrated that I'm not taking faster steps or bigger steps. But, uh, you know, just trying to uh, notch off some wins, you know. Um, the win So for me, like a win this week was that I arranged, you know, three minutes of a big band uh, chart that I had been thinking about for years at this point, <laughs> you know, like a couple, two, three years, I'm like, oh, this tune would be good to arrange. And I jumped in and uh, started getting that going. So it's not done, but <laughs> but at least that happened. So for me, that keeps me motivated, you know, taking those small steps towards big goals, you know, that creates momentum. And uh, so, you know, the big projects I have right now, 
are just like, I'm trying to write music. I can't even decide what the ensemble is yet, but it's percussion ensemble versus with a jazz group of some sort. So that I've been just writing, I don't know, fragments of tunes, ideas for tunes. Uh, I've posted a couple times on Instagram, some little clips of stuff that I'm working on. And then, um, compositionally that is. And then, uh, I'm writing this book, taking my, all the, um, the workshops I've done called create connect repeat and the music marketing roadmap and all that stuff and turning it into a book called create connect repeat. You can see right behind me. You can't see it on Instagram, but on Facebook, you can see, I can't do this backwards, but you can see that the create connect repeat kind of poster in the background. That's my philosophy for, uh, you know, music marketing and, uh, career stuff. And just, you just have to keep on going, man. I've said it for a long time, this industry, uh, in in the jazz area, not so much in the pop area, I would guess. I would I guess, but it's a game of attrition, as they say. Man, no. Come on, come back. All right. So, game of attrition. That's where I left it. And um, so, you know, it's cool. Life goes on. But uh, anyway, so that's what keeps me motivated. I saw a question from DJ here on uh, Instagram. Let me grab this. What's your favorite composition from each record you've done? Oh man. Okay, so that would be five records. Let me think here. On my first record, Exposition, my favorite tune is... I like Overexposure, which is the first tune on... Which is not the first tune. It's like the last tune on the the record. I've always had fun playing that one. That was one of the first tunes I wrote when I was like, I'm going to have a band. Uh, of my with my name on it i had a band before that like a funk kind of fusion band that i co-led with a roommate in college and uh, so i had a band all along but um, to have a band with my name that was the first tune i wrote over exposure so that one kind of sticks with me i like my favorite track on that record is actually the unreleased bonus track maybe i should release that i, I haven't I don't, i've never released it but i have to find the master somewhere but um it was based on a tourist point of view by Duke Ellington and it turned into a piece. But um, anyway, I'll have to find that. But to get back to DJ's question here, second record was The Chase, the title track, my favorite. It's really hard. Uh, that opening is uh, really hard to play, but I like it. It's good energy a good challenge for improvisation. It's like, it's not just like changes or harmony. It's like, uh, a whole kind of palette change, you know, like there's like three, four and four, four and, and uh, a bunch of different characters within that. And then let's see here and now I like, um, I like we, the people, uh, that's a good one. I, I like, um, new beginnings, but I don't get to play it very often. I don't get to play anything very often at the moment. I really want to try to get a regular gig somewhere sometime or get back on the road so we can play that music. There's like 60 some charts in the book for that band. And we've played all the tunes like, I don't know, five times maybe, which is frustrating a little bit. But the hits, you know, We the People gets played a lot. Um, that's, so that's good. But I really like the arrangement of Single Petal of a Rose on there. Uh, if you didn't, And then if you didn't see uh, this week on YouTube, Wednesday, we released a new version of Single Petal of a Rose. Um, so a solo version that w- is also cool. I've been playing that solo version for a few years now. Wanted to get that recorded. I recorded one a couple years ago, but didn't turn out super well. But this one I'm pretty happy with that we just released on Wednesday. If you want to check that out, single pedal of a rose. But I really like the arrangement with the with the bass clarinets and the trombones layered. That came out really well. Thank you, Ryan Truesdell, for the, for those ideas to get make that one happen. Um. And then okay, no arrival. Let's see what. This is my favorite track on No Arrival. Um, that's a good question. I like the blues, the thing that opens it up. Well, see, I call anything that's sort of like a blues a blues, and some people think I'm crazy for doing that, but like the the rinse and repeat is, a, I just call think it's a blues. Some other people are like, that's not a blues. I'm like, it's just a blues with some alternate changes. Um, so I like that one. That one's fun to play over. And then uh, No Arrival, that tune is cool. Stephen Feifke did a great big band arrangement of that. I got to get that. I got to find that and uh, bust that back out again. Um, 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 um. And then, so those are some things there. And then on the new record, cast characters, I think my favorite tune is, um, I like um, The Weatherman on there. And I like, I like Venus too. I've been in kind of a contemplative, kind of quiet mode for a while here. Patience, patience. But Evolution of Perspective is another quasi-blues. I like that one, too. Um, so and any of those, 
So I don't know. Sorry, long answer to a kind of short question from DJ, but uh, it is what it is. All right. Hello, hello. I see lots of people joining on Instagram. I saw some of my students here. Hey, Nick. So Jeffrey, our drummer from the YouTubes, the award-winning YouTubes, won the Kai Winding competition this year, hopefully making it out to Columbus, Georgia this summer for the ITF. Let's see, for insp question inspiration, Gwen Deese is great. Oh yeah, she is. Yeah, I gotta watch some more videos. There's a bunch of videos I've been watching um, for percu percussion ensemble stuff. Um, but if, yeah, if other people have percussion ensemble recommendations, I've been checking out Third Coast Percussion. I've been checking out, um, some other like stuff on like Vic Firth's channel, not like drum corps percussion so much, but like um, classical percussion ensemble stuff. Um, I've been checking out, you know, there's obviously like all the Steve Reich stuff and the, um, what's his name? John Cage stuff. I've heard that, I've seen that. I've seen videos and recitals of that sort of stuff, but I'm trying to find, it's kind of like thinking of like kind of a Pat Metheny meets jazz meets percussion vibe kind of mixed together. I'm not exactly sure what it sounds like yet, but that's the that's the hope. That's the hope at least. Um, okay, so I see some questions over here. Let's go to Dr. B. What's up, Dr. B? Thoughts of using flugelhorn or trumpet to strengthen chops for trombone. Uh, they're different embouchures. I would not do it. Uh, they're different embouchures. I find... Trumpet gets in the way of trombone embouchure because it, it's all in the middle, kind of kind of gets in the way. I would go to tuba instead, go bigger rather than smaller. So I wouldn't do it. Jonathan, yes sir, no problem. Doran, hey Nick, when when do we know when is too much pressure on mouthpiece? If we have a t red ring, does that mean too much pressure? I saw red rings on very good musicians, but can't observe on me. Uh, yeah, man, that happens to me. I play. I mean, it's been a couple minutes since I stopped playing, but. I get a red ring from playing for like two seconds. It has nothing to do, that has nothing to do with the amount of pressure necessarily. Too much pressure, I mean, as little pressure as possible is always um, ideal. Like too much pressure, if you think you're playing with too much pressure, then the answer is probably yes. So you should try to play with less pressure, you know. Um, I've had teachers suggest things like, you know, put the trombone on a stand or put the hang the trombone for this from the ceiling or imagine it's hanging from the ceiling and then you walk up to it and just put your lips up onto it and you should be able to make a sound, right? Um, it just needs to have enough pressure that it seals, like that, that makes a seal around your chops so that you can actually make a sound. That's the first thing. Um, but if it's any more than that, then you're definitely probably playing with too much pressure and I would recommend uh, chilling out. <laughs> That's for sure. So, okay, All right, so we're caught up on questions, great. Um, so yeah, I mean, pressure is like a huge problem that a lot of people have and that they want to like slam the horn into their face and, um, you just want to play relaxed, you know, all the players that I've seen, you know, they look relaxed when they play. So it's like, okay, I'm going to just try to be relaxed. Even if I'm not relaxed, you got to be relaxed because, you know, I've plenty, I've done plenty of gigs where I've slammed the horn into my face and trying to squeeze out a couple more notes or squeeze out a couple more minutes of playing. But it never ends well. <laughs> it never ends well. For me, what happens is that, like, kind of in the back of my nose, like the seal that prevents the air from coming out your nose while you're blowing out your mouth, whatever that's called, it, it like, breaks or, like, leaks when I get super tired and there's too much pressure and too much tension. Um, so that happened a lot, like, in my undergrad when I was at Eastman playing gigs. Sometimes that would happen. Uh, and when I'm out of shape, it happens too. So it still happens, man, and for me. And I try to stay relaxed at with all at all times. You know, like Steve Davis talks about taking like a baby breath, baby's breath, and staying relaxed when you play. I think that that's just the key, man. Like for certain styles of playing, you got to be a little more engaged for sure. Like if you need, if you want that laser focused kind of sound, you definitely need a m more engagement from the core and the air speed and the air column. You know. Um, really to kind of play that way more aggressively i think that that's true also but just to play just to make sound i think you want to be relaxed that's i mean that's my take on it man like why be all like Ugh! you know i mean i had a i had a, a a time when i was you know just after finishing undergrad when i was trying to also lose weight um I was a bit heavier, a bunch heavier when I was in college. And um, 
when I was working out a lot and I just like developed a lot of tension in my neck and that was like leading to that same thing happening. And so since then I've been pretty like clued in to wanting to make sure that I'm relaxed all the time. So I hope that, um, that I encourage you, you know, you look at people on any instrument, like they look relaxed. The best, the best ones always look relaxed. They don't look all the time. Like it's going to be the death of them to play, you know? So anyway, that's enough about enough about that. I see some questions coming in on Instagram. I'm switch over, switch over to Instagram for a second here. Uh, let's do this. Do you have other trauma models you use sometimes or does the King 3B do pretty much everything you need? Yeah. So this goes to like a kind of a broader question of like, there's kind of two, in my opinion, there's two schools of thought usually about equipment. And so the thought, the schools of thought are one, that you should play the right equipment for the right job, right? So you should play the equipment that matches the sound concept or whatever that needs to happen. And then there's another school of thought that says you should play consistently the same thing all the time and you should never switch. Um, I'm more of that second one. So I don't want to have horns that I have to feel like I have to switch. Obviously to double on bass trombone or to play with a trigger horn, like those are different tools for different situations sometimes, but 99 out of 100 gigs, I'm just gonna play that same horn. Um, and that's what I'm looking for in a horn that's important to me is it's not gonna have one sound. It has to have the full array of possibilities, which is kind of why I've stuck with that horn, the 3B Plus, for a while now, because it has a range of possibilities. Um, smaller ones, to me, are a little too focused Bigger ones are a little too diffuse. This one is kind of in the middle and can have some of both. It also is not the best of both both worlds, you know, like it's 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 not as focused as it would be on a 2B or 3B regular ones. Uh, and it's not as diffuse if you if it's a, as if I played a 525 a 548 or larger bore 567 um, whatever. Um, so you have to find what works for you. Um, I find that this is a good um, middle middle of the road, and it doesn't feel too big. You know, some other ones like the 525 Shires I played feel big, felt bigger when I was playing that. But now that um, I've, I mean, it's been a while since then. But but this horn I've been playing since that record, the Chase. I got it like a couple weeks before I recorded that record, and uh, I just haven't looked back. So the first record I recorded on, if you want to compare sounds. Um, it's uh, um, different. It's on my Edwards. I had an Edwards then. So it, that was a different time. But the Edwards is just like more covered and more kind of did one thing, you know, did one thing really well, but it didn't have the range of motion that I wanted it to have. Emotion, not just motion, but emotion. Um, so, you know, that is what it is. But yeah, that's it. That's the answer to your question, Trevor. Hope you're well, man. Oh, here's an interesting uh, question. And I don't know if I have the answer. Maybe somebody with more scientific knowledge can really uh, answer this question from Kevin. He says, does having a lower body weight affect your musicianship? I think some people would argue that it does affect your sound. And I think it did at first because it's less body weight, uh, less, less density. Um, it changes... How, I mean, it changes your sound at first. I mean, you can work to get it back, though. That's what I had to do. I just had to work to get it back. Um, but that's purely observational. Excuse me. I don't necessarily know that that's a real thing. <laughs> I couldn't say that it's real, a scientific thing. But, you know, if perception is reality, then it's real. And, you know, I think that's been the case for other people I've known that have lost a good deal of weight. Um, they've also had not difficulty, but just like an adjustment period to that new body mass. Like you, it's just different, you know, you just have to get used to, to making a sound and having more air with less, you know, density, I guess. But um, ultimately I think um, if you're not healthy and not at a weight where your body is um, in balance, that uh, it's gonna lead to other problems like shoulder problems or neck problems, back problems, knee problems. I mean, all of that, it could happen to you anyway, regardless of that. But um, 
you know, just trying to get it, find a, find a balance of those things, um, is important to me. So that's why, why I went on that, that journey then that was a while, that was a long time ago now. I just tried to keep it up since then, 2009, 2010, but, but yeah, for sure. So I've heard different stories around that. All right. Here's a question from IG. How much preparation do you do when you've been asked to present a masterclass? Um, that's a really good question. Um, at this point, not that much. Um, and I only say that b because I've put in a lot of time thinking about it over the years, like literally since I started my master's, even before that. So in undergrad, in my undergrad and getting finished with my undergrad at Eastman, a friend of mine and I named Chris Teal, uh, we started something called the Institute for Creative Music. And it is a nonprofit that presents um, educational workshops focused around improvisation, focused around jazz, focused around creative music, kind of in a, in, in a, in a wide in a wide circle of uh, definition. And we did that because we felt like there was a lot of jazz musicians that were really great musicians who were in education, but who had never had any ed education training or thought about it in any kind of way, or as you were asking, prepared for their master classes and things of that nature. It was just, sometimes it felt like, I'm not to name anyone, and it's not about anyone in particular, but there were times when we experienced master classes that were just like, hello, I am great. Ask me questions, please. You know, they didn't have any point of view. So, and this is something when I'm um, consulting with artists, so we talk about like, what can you talk about that nobody else can talk about? What's your approach? What's your unique journey to that point that you could share with students that would either allow them to relate, give them a new frame of reference, offer them a, a different way of thinking about something? So I've thought about this for a long time. Um, and I have, you know, four or five things that I like to talk about that I find are my talking points um, that I like to go to in terms of trombone, a trombone masterclass, a music business masterclass, an entrepreneurship masterclass, some combination of, the th of all of that stuff, um, career masterclass, how to m release records, um, music marketing, all of those things are, are kind of all wrapped up into, I have outlines from all the, from the years past of like, okay, in a trombone masterclass, I want to hit on these things. These are the things that are important to me. In a jazz trombone masterclass, I'm going to hit on these things. Um, I have old PDFs of like things I wrote up with like descriptions of different types of classes I could give. Um, and uh, just coming up with an angle. It doesn't so much matter that it's like, totally new or totally unique, but it's like it has to be some kind of angle that you can present that nobody else is going to or that nobody else would present it quite the same way, if that makes sense. Um, and obviously, it's not revolutionary. Everybody's talking about a lot of the same things, but you need some kind, there has to be some kind of reason why somebody wants to bring you in for a masterclass, right? Um, but at this point, I usually, I have a repertoire now of like pieces that I can play solo. That's important because I want to be able to play some stuff for the class. Um, and there's not always a rhythm section or not always a rhythm section that knows tunes. If there is, it's amazing. Um, but I have, you know, not a script, but kind of, you know, talking points at this point. What's up, Nathan from Brazil? Um, I know my talking points basically, and uh, I can kind of go through them and then open up for questions at the end or if people want to go in a particular direction and kind of keep it loose and casual. Or if it's more like, no, you need to talk and give a lecture. You know, I have, uh, you know, what I do for that. And uh, I'm always trying to relate it to things that are happening now and in my teaching and then when I find, oh, well, that doesn't really work super well, I'm going to abandon that. But at this point, I've given enough classes that no matter what the age range is, I've probably given multiple master classes. And that's just because since I was in school, I would give as many master classes as I could, as many classes, not master classes, just teach as much as I could to different people, to get in front of new people, to figure out different techniques for teaching improvisation and jazz and trombone and uh, trying to figure out how to keep students engaged of different ages, because that's a huge problem. Sometimes you get those middle school kids and trying to keep them on track and you're trying to show them something. Sometimes you just gotta be like, all right, let me just like play something to impress them and then uh, get back to talking about uh, long tones or whatever it might be. So uh, anyway, so to wrap up that question, 
in a in a bow perhaps is just like kind of just make an outline of what you might want to talk about and then think about like why should they bring you like what are you what unique value are you going to bring as opposed to anyone else you know um you know so something that i bring that people other people don't bring is kind of a you know an obsession with kind of a duality of like modern and old <laughs> in my trombone like jazz language approach and and things of that nature thinking like you have to master both like and that's one thing and then uh the freedom of expression is the freedom you gain by trombone technique if you can't play the trombone there's no way you're going to be able to express yourself clearly so that's number two and then number three the other thing that i like to talk about is what however you want to describe it either music business or career or just like taking the bull by the horns as they say and uh making stuff happen and how do you do that and how do you put yourself out there and how do you use all the available tools um, and and talk about um, that side of the music industry at the same time so sorry long long answer to your question dj but hopefully that's helpful all right i see some other questions coming in paul paul says how do you manage practicing all these important things and not get overwhelmed of them you got to take one thing at a time if there's anything that i've learned is just you cannot um do more than one thing at a time no matter what like i if i try to do more than one thing right now i'm gonna get distracted you know other than just like maybe drink a cup of coffee there's not a lot otherwise i can do you got to be doing one thing at a time so the same thing goes with trombone if i'm working on articulation i got to work on articulation if i'm working on learning a tune i'm working on learning a tune you can only do one thing at a time and you keep leveling up you keep leveling up your baseline for me so that means fundamentals first because if i don't have strong fundamentals it doesn't matter how much crazy uh technique i think i want to have because i won't have it right and, and so i need to have those fundamentals fundamentals and then i need to have sound and then i need to have um clarity of articulation to have clarity of rhythm and uh, freedom of expression so um one thing at a time that's how you don't, don't get overwhelmed and know that's going to take a long time like you can't think in short term with development on the trombone it's it's long term on any instrument it's uh okay the next six months i'm going to work on sounds i'm going to work on learning the piano i'm going to work on articulation i'm going to change my slide technique it's like one thing at a time one thing at a time i see i don't want to lose this question in, in the comments here this is from nathan how do you manage to velvety the staccatos send a save to brazil um, well, I'd love to come to Brazil. I just did a Brazilian masterclass a couple weeks ago. I'm going to release that on YouTube soon. That's in Portuguese. There's a translator. So if you are a uh, Portuguese speaker, you might enjoy that masterclass when it comes out on YouTube soon. Um, I'm not sure when exactly I'm going to release it, but it's recorded and it's edited. So it'll be out soon. But um, that might help you help you to understand my where I'm coming from with everything that I say. But um, velvety staccatos, you know, my teacher, Steve Trey, he used to call that staccato. And so we would think about having the clarity of the front of the attack from a staccato note. And then you'd have the body of the note be legato. So it has a nice roundness. What's up, Lucas? Hello. Uh, it would have a nice roundness to it. And then the, the notes are separated still, staccato, right? So it, it's got front and end in a nice body. And then you practice doing that on every note. You practice scale exercises, articulation exercises, using um, those things to define um, the rhythm and, and the articulation. So think about that. So we got legato over here, staccato over here, staccato in the middle. And that's how we get a velvety. I like how you put that. I like that. It's velvety. It's nice, man. I think of a bubbly sometimes, but not vel velvety. Good question, Paul. Thank you. Uh, okay, M. Bennett, 22. I'm having trouble balancing and playing my horn while using a plunger. Ah, yes, the eternal battle. Uh, my plunger is at school, so I can't demonstrate right now, but I can do my best. So, okay, plunger. So you first of all, it's just a matter of balance of balance at any um, stage here. So you got to get uh, used to balancing the horn. This is how I do it as if I was holding. So the weight goes in this part of your hand, the bottom part of your hand. Let me see if I can get better for you. 
<clears throat> for Instagram here. And then the plunger would go here, right? So you would want to hold it in the base of your palm, hold it up off your shoulder. If you try to go like this, you're going to get a crick in your neck. So you're going to hold it up. So there's a certain amount of like pressure that you're putting with your arm so that it holds the trombone up, right? You hold it up into your neck a little bit so that it's like kind of bracing. But you're not pushing because that would, again, that would end up with a lot, a lot, a lot of pressure, which we don't want. And then, you know, but it's, it's just a matter of balancing. And I will say that in undergrad, when I was practicing that, trying to get used to doing the plunger, a pixie and plunger, it um, was uncomfortable for a long time. It's more comfortable now. And I used to even get like pain in my, my, my forearm because um, I was holding it weird. So you got to find a balance for you in how you hold the horn. Um, I like to say, you know, every single person needs to figure this stuff out for themselves. I can give you pointers, but ultimately I don't know what your body feels like. So you need to figure out how to balance it. You know, um, if you're playing a trigger, a horn, a horn with an F attachment, it's probably too heavy and that's probably giving problems as well. Um, so if you can think about, <clears throat> you know, playing a straight tenor, that can always help and get it up off your shoulder hold it with the the base of your palm hopefully those things uh are helpful to you and uh yeah and just know that you got to build up strength uh to be able to hold it and um just get used to it at a certain rate you know no pain no gain as they say not that i advocate for pain but uh it is just the truth sometimes What's up, Ben? Just joining us. Nestor, Blinkside. Hope everyone's doing well on this Friday, March the 5th. And yes, I did put in the wrong date in the title of the video. Uh, typical of me to do something like that. Oh, interesting. So the, he says that it's the straight horn that's causing you issues. Well, my idea, my thought is that you probably have it kind of sideways and diagonal, and you got to get it up. And you got to hold it and put the weight into this part of your hand and get used to moving from the wrist. It's because you may, you might be moving the, the plunger wrong. Not wrong, but not ideally, you know? Uh, let's see, Kevin says, I'm working on a simple device that does that while using plunger mute. Nice. Um, that's cool. Oh yeah, you sent me that video. That was cool. Um, yeah, man, I mean, you just gotta get the balance down and just know you gotta get the strength together in your arm and your shoulder to hold that, to hold it up. No problem, no problem. All right, I just have a couple more minutes today um, to continue with the Q&A if anyone wants to drop anything else in. Uh, I got an interview to do at the top of the hour, so I'm gonna take a couple minutes before that starts, but uh, happy to answer one or two more questions if anybody has any. In the meantime, I wanna bring up to everyone's attention again, we have our Jazz Trombone boot camp that's open for registration. Uh, right now, and we're going to have really great guest artists, uh, including Steve Davis, Vincent Gardner, Andre Hayward, and Michael Davis, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's June 14th through 18th, and um, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be on Zoom. I wish we could do it in person, but uh, I don't think we're all going to know what's happening in June until June, so it's hard to make any in-person uh, collaboration uh, things. So June 14th through 18th, website, nickfinzer.store. You'll see it. You'll find it. I hope you will join that. I see two quick questions, and then we're going to jump off here. Uh, Caleb Davis, quick question. What's your favorite color? It used to be orange growing up. I guess it's blue now. Uh, everything I've been going, leaning, gravitating towards blue. Uh, Lazam Beats, play us a tune. Uh, I can't play you a tune right now. Maybe next time. What's up, Nick Crane? Hello. Uh, and then last question, Ben Lafo says, do you have any experience with embouchure overuse? Um, that is a good question. Yes. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, and even with my students as well, it's something that happens. So what I like to think about is practicing in opposites. So if you have a hard day, 
then you need to practice easy. If you have an easy day, then you need to practice hard. Um, so you get used to the kind of the dichotomy of going back and forth. If you had a loud gig, you need to practice soft. If you had, a, if you've been playing a lot into a mute, if you've been playing really soft for a while, you need to go and play loud and use the, you know, practice in opposites, always in opposites, so that we're building up all the different facets of our playing. This goes back to being relaxed. This goes back to making sure that you're on uh, equipment that's comfortable and that you're not um, killing yourself to try to like make the sound that you hear. You know, that's why, I mean, for me, switching equipment is a last ditch effort, but at a certain amount, at a certain time, um, hey, Demetrius, how are you, man? At a, cer at a certain time, you, you might have to switch equipment to um, get the sound that you're looking for and be able to sustain that. You know, a lot of people, maybe they go bigger, 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 and then they go back to somewhere in the middle, you know, um, because it has to be sustainable uh, for the long run. Uh, most of the problems I see with people with overuse is that they just play for they play too hard for too long on too big of equipment. So if you're playing hard and it's getting you're getting tired playing large equipment, you might want to switch to something easier or play less. And if that's not an option, maybe you want to switch to smaller equipment so it doesn't take as much effort to make a sound, you know. Um, but whenever there's overuse, I tend to go to whisper tones, long tones. And again, that practicing in opposites. So it usually means working on practicing really soft, which can be um, hard for some people because uh, they haven't done it before. So with overuse, that's what I always go to. Whisper tones, long tones. Take it easy. Make sure you're practicing in opposites and just like give yourself a chance to build back up because your chops are a muscle just like any other muscle. And if you break it down, you got to let them build back up. Um, so don't, uh, you can't, you can't, bust them down every day after day after day after day after day. Um, and so you, that might mean you have to be creative in the ways that you practice. It might mean that you have to be more on the piano some days. Um, so yeah, that's it. All right, I gotta jump off. It's been great to chat with everyone today, March 5th, Friday, and uh, we'll be back next week uh, with another Q&A session. Maybe we'll play some uh, music for that on um, that session as well. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a fantastic weekend and um, we will catch you all very soon and uh, as always you can feel free to drop questions throughout the week and uh, i'll see if i can get to them on friday